Welcome to Students Over Systems, where we talk with the creators, advocates, and beneficiaries of education freedom. I'm your host, Jenny Gentles. On today's episode, we're going to talk about how a conservative vision for education can cultivate schools that are formative, flexible, and human. For this important discussion, we're joined by Rick Hess and Michael McShane, authors of a new book, Getting Education Right, A Conservative Vision for Improving Early Childhood, K-12, and College. Rick is the Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, author of the Rick Hess Straight Up column at Education Re Week, Executive Editor of Education Next, and a former teacher and professor. Mike is an adjunct fellow with AEI, Director of National Research at EdChoice, an opinion contributor to Forbes, and a former high school teacher. Both Rick and Mike have written so, so many books on education policy. Dr. Hess and Dr. McShane, thank you for joining us on Students Over Systems. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Jenny. So I mentioned that the book covers K-12 education, early childhood, and college. Here at Students Over Systems, we like to focus on K-12, so that's let's do that for our discussion um, today. And K-12, I don't know, things are pretty bleak, and parents are pretty weary, especially after the last four years we've dealt with COVID-era prolonged school closures, school systems that view parents as the enemy, chaotic classrooms, discipline issues, and a devastating learning loss crisis. So what hope do you offer parents like me who are so weary in this book? Rick, I'll, I'll toss that one to you. Uh, you know, I mean, I think the fact that parents are so frustrated um, itself creates some opportunities to do things better. I mean, I think one of the challenges uh, for people trying to address red tape and bureaucracy and lack of learning and uh, the creeping reach of dogma in schools over the last 10 or 15 years has been most people tend to like their kids' schools. They're busy. Um, if they put their kid on the bus at the, you know, in the morning and the kid gets off in the afternoon and seems happy and safe and to have some friends, most parents are like, look, I'm busy. That's, that's good enough. And partly what's happened is so many parents between the pandemic and school closures and uh, how evident some of the craziness has become in schooling, uh, the parents have woken up to the fact that there's a lot to be frustrated with. And I think once you actually have that energy, well, there are things we can do better. And what Mike and I try to do is talk about in this book, some of the things we can do better. Some of them are about um, reestablishing school cultures. Some of them are about changing laws uh, about what happens in schools. Some of them are about empowering parents and families to make sure they can do what's best for their kid. Um, but what we've really tried to do in this book is offer um, a vision of what goes forward and not just frustration about where we are today. Uh, I'm all on board for a vision. You ground the vision in conservative principles and you write that you value local control, tradition, pluralism belief in challenging bureaucracies and cartels, and that you prefer practical policies that emphasize opportunity, family, and community. So all that sounds good to me. Um, how about the other people in our K-12 education policy world? Are these commonly held beliefs among, among K-12? So I think they actually are. Like maybe not in the policy space, maybe not if you're going to a seminar in an ed school, but I think that actually if you talk to parents, if you talk to most teachers, I'd like to think that the vision that we put forward for schools, like that you brought up there, that are more flexible, that are formative in their mission, um, that are more human in their scale and community focused. I feel like when you talk to teachers and you ask them, like, why did you get involved in this? Those were the types of schools that they want to teach in. When you talk to parents, like what 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 type of school do you want to send your child to? Um, we have lots of polling data that says, you know, I just um, with EdChoice just last week came out um, with a new survey of parents, and one of the things you you, you know you had mentioned the politicization of schools and others. I mean, eighty four percent of a nationally representative sample of parents told us that they want teachers to keep their politics to themselves. Right. They're, they're not even saying we want schools that necessarily are aligned with our politics. They actually don't even always care if schools are not aligned with their politics as long as they just keep it to themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just like more and more of this evidence that people are kind of crying out. We ask questions about school discipline. People want school dis schools that have more discipline as opposed to less. They want schools that are more rigorous as opposed to less. So I think that the, the message that we put out there resonates. And, and, you know, it's conservative in the title, but 
And we know from some of the blurbers and others that people from across the political spectrum, I think, are really responding to it and are saying, oh, yeah, like this is what this is what we want schools to look like. All right. Well, Mike, that sounds really positive and hopeful. And yes, I, I totally believe that most parents and community members have sensible views when it comes to K-12 education. But what about the people in our policy world? Like what about the foundations and the thought leaders and the folks that, uh, I don't know, like the unions that have a lot of control and leverage over the policymakers? Rick, I feel like you're going to be honest with me uh, on your take on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jenny, you know, I've talked about this before. If you recall about five years ago, Jay, you know, I, this is something that, you know, I think all three of us and many of our colleagues have been pointing out for 15 years or more. Um, people didn't really believe it. About five years ago, our friend Jay Green and I did an analysis of the political giving of folks who got grants from two major education foundations, the Gates Foundation and the Walton Foundation, both of which are tagged as neoliberal by the kinds of people you find in ed schools. 99% of the Gates giving went to people who give to Democrats. Uh, over 90% of the Walton giving went to people who give to Democrats. Um, you know, I, I always say, you know, you can walk down the hallway of any major education foundation or advocacy group and throw a bowling ball and the odds of hitting a Republican are pretty slim. So, look, uh, the elite world of education tilts massively one way. Mm -hmm. um, but this actually, it, this has a couple of effects people don't always realize. Um, you know, one, Mike and I have written about that m m teachers and principals look a lot more like America than the folks in these advocacy foundations and ed schools and curriculum outfits. Um, but they get all this terrible advice about how you talk to real Americans because they're always getting this language training and the sensitivity training that assumes everyone is as crazy as a sophomore at Oberlin, um, <laughs> which creates a whole lot of disconnect and talking past each other when you get to real families and, and real, uh, you know, in real communities. So one, what we're trying to do is equip everybody. Like we say, we're conservatives. You, you, you sketch kind of our kind of conservatism. There's other kinds. Mm -hmm. This is our kind. And we're decidedly, we're not political types. We're not talking about Republicans or Democrats. We're not talking about, you know, how you feel about Donald Trump or Joe Biden. We're talking about a set of values and core beliefs. And we think, like Mike says, that these are actually really broadly shared. And the fact that you get this set of uh, money, uh, of donors and advocates and, and, and education experts who are wildly out of step with 70, 80, even 90 percent of Americans on some of the core issues you can get to, um, the, that should actually be a problem for them, not for the 70, 80, or 90%. But part of the problem is folks haven't been aware of what's going on. They haven't had good practical options put before them, and they haven't felt like there's practical ways to make their voice heard. Mm -hmm. And the last problem has been that as we have seen people waking up and getting frustrated, some of that has been unfortunately directed by grifters and lunatics online who are busy trying to raise money on the right wing and generate clicks rather than actually make sure that these parents and, and, and communities are heard and that their energy is channeled productively. So the enemies, the people who are doing bad things, but the enemy is also the grifters who are tricking parents into getting caught up in clickbait rather than actually getting their concerns for their kids resolved. Yeah, I think parents are ready for a pause from the outrage and the clicks. And I don't know who you're talking about when you say grifters and lunatics, but just the the extreme reaction to everything. And they just want things to settle down and they want to go back to what they view as normal. But I think that we need to dig in in this conversation about like, well, it, is, is normal okay and and good because it has been a, a benefit i think to the future of the k-12 education system that we've realized that our residentially assigned schools that we bought into with our you know houses in good neighborhoods that's not they're not doing that well <laughs> they're not serving students well they certainly aren't responsive to the concerns of of parents um and so those parents that might not have been out there kind of like screaming online yelling at school board meetings but are just like have this like low to medium level of concern i think that's who you're talking to 
in this book. And it's time to have those conversations and to make sure that their voices are heard and that they have um, hope and a vision forward. All right. So looking back, um, though, we uh, are warned by your book that conservatives, and I'd add parent and parents, do well to be leery of grand schemes and sweeping top-down projects. So I totally agree. I said so in a, a recent piece for uh, Fusion, an online magazine that you all invited me to, to write. Um, my original title of the, the piece was uh, had something about like the razzle-dazzle. We need to avoid the lure <laughs> of, of the technocratic um, razzle-dazzle. Um, but why why haven't we? Like why does the education world constantly get caught up in the lure of the next big thing? Um, I, Mike, I'll I'll throw that to you. But Rick, I'd be curious sure. to what you think too. Well, look, I think one is that, and and as we've been involved in sort of education policy for a while, look, it attracts idealistic people. And I think it particularly attracts a lot of young idealistic people. And these are the types of folks that want to change the world and they want to change the world now. And there's so many things that I think are actually admirable about that. And, and I have respect about that. And, you know, when I was starting off as a teacher and then going to graduate school, there's, I probably had a healthy dose of that as well. So I can't be too judgmental of other people, but, you know, we have that, um, that sort of intuition that's in there and, and it needs to be tempered by, a bit of conservatism. You know, we talk about in the book, the great example of something like Chesterton's fence, this idea that was put off, um, you know, a hundred years ago by GK Chesterton, this idea of, you know, never tear down a fence until you know why it was put there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you know, you might end up staring a bull dead in the eyes when it happens. And I think so many of the folks that are involved in education, again, it, for many admirable reasons, they don't heed those types of lessons. They're like, well, we need to change all of this stuff or we need to do something different. It's like, well, why was it there? Maybe, maybe it was there for bad reasons or reasons that don't exist anymore and we should change it. And I think a lot of stuff, obviously, as a big school choice person, myself and others, like we're advocating, I advocate for change all the time, but I like to think of it. It's sort of leavened with this idea of understanding, well, why does the system work the way that it does? Why are schools funded the way that they are? What problems was that designed to solve? And are those problems still in existence today? And so I think if we can challenge some of those intuitions, that sort of really kind of righteous desire to do better by kids and to say that the current education system is not acceptable and the outcomes that we're seeing, particularly for poor children, are not acceptable, um, but do it in a way that sort of understands change and, and sort of change properly understood um, is the way to sort of be much more productive and less chasing the new fad or, you know, like I think uh, Rick's great first book, uh, spinning wheels to prevent people from just spinning their wheels and every 18 months trying some new thing. And then when it doesn't work out, um, trying some new, new thing. And then teachers get frustrated and everyone thinks nothing works. And so um, it breeds a certain cynicism and all sorts of problems. So it's all about channeling, I think, those intuitions uh, um, with with sort of the, the life experience <laughs> and a, a bit of knowledge of history, maybe a dash of political science, a little bit of economics and, and, and making uh, making the soup <laughs> a little a bit better. Well, y'all talk about wisdom in the book, which I appreciate because the K-12 world is is constantly kind of talking as if, and you put this, children are problems to be solved or widgets to be engineered. And you back it way up and you're like, no, let's let's be wise about, about what we're doing. Um, Rick, well, I'm assuming this is you. The government is a set of rules, agencies, and mechanisms. It cannot love you. It cannot love your children. Um, what are your thoughts on this like lure of the next big thing and this mindset that uh, that the government will be in charge, even though it, it really um, it can't it can't know and and love kids like families do and like uh, education options that are are more like intimate uh, settings. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, and this is, you know, one of the nice things about writing this book is Mike and I could, you know, steal shamelessly from people who are much more thoughtful than we are. So, you know, this is Burke and Kirk and, yeah. you know, a litany uh, uh, of, you know, folks who've thought deeply about these issues. You know, I mean, they're, right, the, 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 there's a healthy tension in the world between progressives and conservatives. And I think, you know, America has always fared best when you had that real you know, let's put our best ideas on the table. Uh, unfortunately, in education, it's such a tilted playing field that conservatives tend to get away with putting their worst ideas forward. 
So the laziest thinking out of the unions, the most self-serving stuff out of the college cartel, winds up passing for kind of policy ideas. And so partly what Mike and I are talking about here is just obvious stuff. Yeah, there, there's, you know, it's easy uh, for our progressive friends to explain why they are concerned that there are enough funds to educate kids in challenging circumstances. Um, yeah, we understand that there are challenging home environments, that not every parent is doing the right thing by their kids, and that there's a role for oversight. If those, you know, when, when we're in a healthy place, we're pointing out, on the other hand, that the idea that a teacher who is with your kid for nine months is uh, other things equal, going to have better visibility into a child's needs, concerns, um, and, and, and life situation than a parent who raises them for 18 years is nuts. The idea that a teacher who gets a new batch of nine-year-olds every single September is going to love each of those kids or care more about what happens to them than the parent who birthed them and kind of tucks them in every night is nuts. But we've gotten out of the habit of talking about that, talking about it in a way that challenges the assumptions of equity and bureaucracy in ways that lead to these one-size-fits-all mechanical solutions. So, you know, part of what part of what's missing here is, you know, and it's funny, in education, conservatives wind up talking a lot about markets because we're trying to help people understand the problems with the logic of one-size-fits-all bureaucracy. But as a result, conservatives sometimes have gotten out of the habit of talking in the much more intuitive language of humanity. What, what is conservatism about at the end of the day? It's about the belief that those big, you know, shiny progressive dreams of progress can be inhuman, that they can take us away from the little things that really, really matter. Burke's little platoons, families, the love of parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents, you know, the role of, um, you know, of, of a church or a place of faith in a child's life, the importance of offline friendship and neighborly ties, that these are the things we should be talking about. And one of the reasons when we talk about empowering families to make the right choice is we want to do it in a way that doesn't make families feel like we're threatening the ties they do have. Some families really value those Friday night foot, uh, football games. They value the ties they make through the PTA. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about empowering families, we also want to be clear that we're not disrespecting that or threatening that, that this is about allowing families and communities to make the decisions that they know are going to be right for them and their kids. I feel like we're always talking in pro-parent language, though. We're talking about empowering parents. We're supporting parents when they push back on the education bureaucracy, but somehow it's conservatives and also concerned parents who are the ones who are smeared as wolves at the schoolhouse door that were called mean-spirited and suspect and scary. Um, why? Why does that keep happening? And how, how do we how do we change that? I mean, I know we don't have control over uh, the language that Randy Weingarten is using on, on Twitter, but well, you know, York Times, the whole progressive left in the media is smearing us as tinfoil hat crazies when we push back on the next big thing. Um, it's, it's dispiriting. So how do, how do we, how do we change this? Well, look, I think it's a couple things. I think one, obviously speaking to those core deep American values that are shared by 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on how you poll fee people, you know, the values of things like working hard, the values of things like patriotism, like faith, like <laughs> these things all pull really well. So when, you know, when something like the KIPP schools gets rid of work hard, be nice, like if you wanted to find like poll tested the best message for schools you could put out there, say, we want schools that are going to teach kids to work hard and be nice. So when you're moving away from that, like you're going in the wrong direction. And but if like, you're, if, like, let's pause if your for a echo moment. chamber, oh, go yeah. ahead. Why, why did they go away from that? Yeah, I was gonna say, so if your echo chamber is telling you that, then you realize that you are in a bubble, like you are in a bubble that is not representative. So I don't doubt that the leadership of that organization was getting hammered by the bubble of people around them, that it was terrible. But if they would have taken one step outside of that, or looked at the population at large, they've been like, oh, 
this is not representative. You know, what was it? Who was the, the person who said, you know, I didn't know anybody who voted for Nixon or whatever. It's like, yeah, of course, because those are the people that you surrounded yourself with. So so I think that's one thing is speaking to these broadly held values, recognizing that the Ed School set is not going to like you or the New York Times is not going to like you, but recognize that I don't even know what the New York Times readership is, but it's a, you know, a certain percent, a small percentage of Americans and we're talking to everybody else. Yeah. But I will say the other one, and it sort of ties into what Rick was talking about earlier too, is that, you know, replacing foolishness with more foolishness is not the way forward. So I think, you know, we obviously speak a lot in this about the content of education. We talk about, you know, the harmful effects that we think of things like critical race theory or DEI or others. We think about the books that are available to children or that should not be available to children. Um, but I think taking care in the way that we do that, not doing it in a knee jerk way, being careful about that we the way that we craft those laws and speak about those things to not make it easier for those people to cast you as that. So focusing on those key things that everybody shares, being careful in the way that we pursue them. You, like I said, you're still going to have the Ed School set. You're still going to have the New York Times set against you, but you've maximized the likelihood that real normal people are going to side with you. Yeah, I've, I've read in that uh, Fusion online journal piece that I'm a, a former awkward band geek, so I don't care what they think about me. And I, I guess that's, that's helpful. Yeah, I think that that's kind of, you know, a, a lot of us, we just don't care. But unfortunately, a lot of parents do care. They don't want to be judged by the the Facebook. Well, you know, and it, you know, but it's also it's, they don't want to be judged, but it's also, you know, people you know, most normal people have a lot of other things going on in their lives other than this stuff that we're talking about. So we focus on this. You know, what they're going by are general cues. And, you know, one problem is we have not always done a good job of speaking to the the simple core value stuff. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I remember doing a column, you know, like Mike said, back in summer 2020, Kip abandoned their slogan, work hard, be nice. They said it was because it was a legacy of white supremacy culture. Um, I wrote about this. It was impossible to find a folks on the right re, 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 writing about it. And B, I got so much grief from people on the right who were funding KIPP who said, Rick, but they're one of the good guys. Why are you giving them a hard time? This is what has come up time and again over the years with Teach for America, even after it became unapologetically left. It's, so one, there's a hesitation, I think, to speak frankly and fully about things. People are nervous about articulating the things we believe in mm -hmm. for reasons that have long escaped me. That's one. The second thing is we also know that the New York Times and NPR and Washington Post are going to play the game that you've just described. So there's also the question of, are you going to make it easy on them? You know, one of the things that crushed Democrats in that same 2020 was they couldn't stop the yahoos talking about defund the police. If you remember Abigail Spanberger after the election thing, if I ever hear any idiot say that again, because there were lots of reasonable Democrats on policing, um, but they were drowned out by the, the folks who were saying the wildest possible thing. And I think we have this problem in education, the whoops at the door. Most people I know who are interested in school choice, or like you're saying, want to focus on giving families more options, letting them do what's right for them. We're no longer just talking about lifeboats for kids in lousy urban schools. We're now talking about things like ESAs, which solve problems for every family. But it's not at all hard to find folks with a lot of online traffic. A lot of them don't even really do education talking about we have to blow up school districts. We got to blow up it. And that's obviously a much more newsworthy quote than we want to give families the option to do what's best for them. So just like the Democrats, you know, progressives, you know, eventually understood that they had to do some self-policing if they didn't want to keep shooting themselves in the foot. I think, you know, folks who are supportive of the kinds of values Mike and I talk about, who want to empower parents, um, they, they want to be conscious of how, what high profile folks are saying when it comes to the things we believe in. All right. So we're not going to be uh, grifters and lunatics. And we're not going to have this like just say no mentality to everything that the progressive left proposes. Um, what should we be pushing for? Like other than knowledge is good. What, uh, what are we, what are we for? And I guess specifically, I mean, like, what should we be expecting from schools? 
Yeah, I mean, I was going to go in a slightly different. So what we should be expecting from schools again, I mean, we talked about these ideas you brought up at the beginning, this idea of formative, this idea of flexible, this idea of human. So like, schools that take the formation of young people seriously, where they have a rigorous education, where they encounter big, important ideas, they read things, we quote a great educator in there, they read things that are worthy of their affection. So you look at the books the kids are reading, look at the discussions that they're having, look at the way that they're engaging with one another, the way they're encouraged to ask questions, the, that, that sort of rigorous, full education is definitely one thing we should be expecting out of them. The second thing, obviously, is around the structure, that flexibility. We should we should expect schools that are able to partner with parents, whether that's, you know, flexibility around when they meet or where they meet, but also what they're studying, how they're studying it, the way that they're encountering it. So I think that that flexibility is obviously something we should expect. And then that last bit is human. We really should expect schools to be communities. We want them to, I think, generally be voluntary communities, right, <laughs> where people are selecting into these things, but where the adults know each other as well and care about each other as well and are sort of rowing the boat in the same direction as their teachers. So it's the a sort of triangle of teachers, parents, and students all working towards a similar goal um, that, uh, that that provides support for one another, both inside the classroom, but also outside and all the various other things that children and families need. Um, and so things like school choice and all these are, are ways to get schools that look like that, but they're the sort of beginning. <laughs> and then folks actually have to use those things to create these types of institutions. Well, okay, so formative, flexible, human, you guys get a little more specific in the book as well. You talk about the importance of schools not retreating from clear disciplinary expectations. Like let's have these, let's have these schools function in ways yeah, that right. we're, <laughs> we're not seeing right now in too many places uh, right now. And and I love how much values comes up throughout this book. Like let's, I mean, re and that's, you know, that's I mean, the formative part, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead. I mean, part of, part of the formative is you're exactly right, Jenny. I mean, it, it's broad, right? For us, it's about clear expectations. So clear expectations for discipline. Um, when kids misbehave, there need to be consequences. Mm -hmm. There need to be consequences at school, and schools need to make clear that parents are expected to work with them on this, period. Uh, there needs to be expectations about academic rigor. Uh, grade inflation is a huge problem. We need to set clear expectations. Uh, teachers need to be encouraged to grade seriously, and schools have got to get their back when they grade seriously. We need to support advanced instruction, gifted programs. Uh, challenging course instruction. Some of this nonsense from California wanting to eliminate advanced math in grade one to 10, to efforts to you know do away with eighth grade algebra, to Oregon insisting that asking kids to show work is racist. We need to unapologetically stand up with like 90% of all normal human beings and say this stuff is insane. Um, we need to be clear that school, the K-12 is not a college prep factory. It is Kids should leave at the end of 12th grade equipped to do what they want to do. If they want to go to college, they should be ready to do so. If they want to go find gainful employment, we should have career and technical options that set them up to have meaningful, fulfilling, uh, remunerative lives. So when we talk about kind of that formative piece, it's formative both in terms of students as young people, but it's also formative in terms of the kind of serious, meaningful, rigorous um, instruction that uh, you know that we think any any conservative worth their, worth their salt has always taken for granted. Well, a big part of that formation is partnering with parents. Schools must partner with parents. You all say that education is a handshake. What do you mean by that? Well, we think. Look, along with parental rights come parental responsibilities. Um, that. We're, you know, we're big supporters of parental rights and we want parents to be able to choose their child's school and we want schools to be transparent in what they're providing. They should know what books they're reading. They should know the policies around race and gender and all of these issues. Schools should be super transparent and parents have a right to that knowledge. Full stop. At the same time, parents have responsibilities that come along with this. So parents need to be working with their child's teacher not working against them. So the the example I always give, I think back to my teaching days, you know, if a kid's not supposed to have their cell phone out and you take their cell phone and it goes down to the office and their parent comes after school and just takes the phone angrily and hands it back to their kid. It's like, yeah, well, 
that's not going to work. Or when you call home and the teacher's mad at you that their kid didn't do their homework. And it's like, well, that's not going to work either. Um, we have to work together on this. And so having parents send their kids to school ready to learn. Mm -hmm. Are they saying, hey, listen, um, it's eight o'clock at night. You need to get off your phone or you need to not be on the Internet. Or what are you doing? You know, being cognizant of all of those sorts of things. Um, parents need to to play a role in this as well. And, and look, and I think we make an argument in the book that some of some of um, education reform in the last two decades has really cared about one side of that handshake and has been all about how can we measure teachers better and fire the, the worst performing and all of that. And again, like not necessarily bad ideas for those, but if that's the only side of the handshake that you care about, well, we shouldn't be super surprised when teachers aren't on board with all the stuff that we're talking about, sort of tied into what you were talking about earlier. It's like, oh, teachers don't think we're on their side. Well, if all we ever talk about is what they do wrong and we never bring up anybody else, can you blame them? Like that doesn't strike me as entirely unreasonable. But I think if we are full throated in saying, listen, we expect you teachers to be professionals, to be trained in the correct ways, to use things like the science of reading and all these wonderful advances that are being made now. And we expect you to be evaluated rigorously. Yes, yes, and yes, right? At the same time, we are going to give it just as hard to parents to say, you need to do your bit as well. To me, that is, that's a serious conversation for serious people. And we'll actually get people on both sides of that to, to commit to it and to create better schools. Yeah, I'm on board. I'm, I'm ready to not be blasé about parental re responsibilities anymore. Like with, when we have chronic absenteeism rates that have doubled since 2019 right. and in some cities are over 50 percent, then parents aren't holding up their end of the handshake, their end of the deal. And um, and, you know, all of us have to fight the screens and the phones and the getting our kids to bed earlier. So I appreciate you you bringing that up. Like this is a across all parents challenge sure. that that we've got to face and 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 we have to hold each other accountable for that. Um I do want to criticize teachers a little bit. Although I do <laughs> like in my IWF work, Independent Women's Forum work, we're trying to make it very clear that we love caring, dedicated classroom teachers. Of course we do. Like we're parents. We love our children's teachers. We do not love, in fact, we strongly dislike unions and union leaders and the policies that they're advocating for because it's they're generally very anti anti student and anti education. Um, but we do have some specific examples, including some in the book of, of uh, teachers being performative rather than uh, formative. And uh, I'd love, Rick, for you to talk about the, the example of the, the teacher teaching um, Romeo and Juliet. My 10th uh, <laughs> grader got a real kick out of that one. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I mean, it, and this comes up a lot. Uh, the RAND, Rand uh, teacher panel came mm. out a couple weeks ago with a big report. And the RAND researchers were terribly troubled that teachers were saying they were less likely to talk about social and political issues in class uh, than they had been before after these laws. And uh, my colleague, Robert Pendicio, and I had got a lot of queries about this. And our general reaction was the same. It was good. Uh, classrooms do not exist as places for teachers to share their political and cultural and social views. Um, it's entirely possible to study Jim Crow or Korematsu uh, or the history of women's suffrage without ever learning how your teacher voted in 2016. And the fact that, you know, there's so much online agitation suggesting that if teachers don't get to tell you their politics, that somehow means you don't want them to dig into real history is lunacy. Right. But it, but, 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 but that has taken hold. And so what Mike and I try to do in the book is draw a really simple uh, distinction articulated most beautifully by uh, our colleague Yuval Lev uh, Levin. Levin. <laughs> Sorry, Yuval. Um, and uh, what you, you, Yuval draws the distinction between institutions which are formative and performative. Schools exist as places for kids to learn, to explore, to be challenged. They do not exist so that teachers can perform, so they can tell you what they think, so they can work out some issues hungover from their teens or 20s. They can go to therapy for that. That's not why they have classrooms. So, you know, in the book, Mike and I talk about this teacher who felt moved to write an entire back page essay for Education Week, sharing how she teaches a Shakespearean uh, drama. When she reads Romeo and Juliet with her students, she likes to stop so that she can give a thumbs down 
whenever there's a misogynist statement and she can lead the class in a chorus of boos. Now, yeah, you know, not only does that seem a, a pretty small-minded, small-minded way to approach 400-year-old piece of great literature, but you know, if the teacher had said, "I want to talk to my kids about changing norms and why they spoke that way then and why that would be wrong today," I might not think it's necessarily honoring Shakespeare, but I think Mike and I would concede that that's formative education. You're asking students to wrestle with real issues in the real literature. What she was doing, though, was using Shakespeare as a chance for her to practice her TikTok performance. And that is disrespectful to the bard, it's disrespectful to the job, and it's disrespectful to the students in her classroom. Where are these teachers coming from? Like, what about the teacher pipeline welcomes or, or cultivates these performative outrage artists? Um, I don't know if that's Mike or a Rick. Well, question. look, we talk about in the book, I mean, you know, in the opening, we say, you know, most people don't really realize how the world of education is like one standard deviation to the left of the American polity. You have to remember the schools of education are like another standard deviation to the left of them. You know, like even when you're on a college campus, you know, the school of education is substantially to the left of campus. Like it's so, it's so wild how, how that's happened. Um, and look, it's, it's a sort of self-perpetuating cycle that the, the people who prepare teachers went to these sorts of institutions. You know, um, Rick and I were talking recently, you know, one of the, the most cited books that shows up in this is the pedagogy of the oppressed. Paul, Paulo Freire's book, you know, that's talking, that's based on his experience teaching, you know, Brazilian peasants in the 1940s and 1950s. And now listen, if I was teaching Brazilian peasants in the 1940s and 1950s, I might have become a radical myself too. They, they got a bum deal. Like it was not great. Um, now the fact that kids in Arlington, Virginia, <laughs> are good, like are getting trained on the book written about like, um, training peasants in the forties and fifties shows that like a lot of these ideas haven't been updated. Uh, they weren't necessarily super sound from the jump, but they haven't necessarily been updated. Um, and so it just continues to sort of marinate, um, in this, in this same situation. And look, and this is something that we highlight in the book that I think deserves like lingering on for a minute, like the fact that conservatives and teachers, that that relationship has been severed is nuts and is wrong and should be a sign that things have gone south, right? Think of all of the other kind of street level public servants, like cops, like people in the military that tend to be much more conservative, that tend to, to lean, uh, sort, sort of lean conservative on those things. The fact that we've kind of lost that connection and we've ceded so much of this ground to organizations like teachers unions, to this sort of training cartel that exists, um, shows that there's like, there, there's work that needs to be done here. And we'd speak a lot in the book about, look, you know, again, if teachers are upset, the way that education reform has happened over the last couple of decades, where it seems like everyone's talking about them and no one's talking about the other side. I get it. That seems fair. If we look at teacher pay over the last 20 to 30 years, how even though there have been huge increases in the amount of money that we've spent, not much of it is actually making it into teachers' pockets. I can get how they'd be, ups be upset by that. And I could get how they could blame whoever or how they would want to say, man, I really need to join a union because we're, I'm not getting the pay raises that I want. Uh, parents are all set against me. It seems like all the policymakers are against me. So in some ways, we are pushing them into the arms of these organizations that we don't like. So we have to take a hard look in the mirror and say, what are the things either policy-wise or culturally that we're advancing that are causing this as well? So the crazy thing, of course, is how much low-hanging fruit there is here. So, you know, we've increased the number of students in K-12 education over, since 2000 by 5%. We've increased the number of central office bureaucrats by 90%. Right. Now, it's not us. We're not the folks who are like, oh, we need more bureaucrats. Like, that's those guys. Yet somehow we get tagged as the So what we ought to do is offer teachers a very simple deal. Tell you what, we want to zero out. Half of the bureaucrats that have been added, just, just half the bureaucrats have been added, 100,000 of them since kind of No Child Left Behind. And we want to put those dollars into take-home pay for teachers who are doing important work. Let's, let's let the unions 
respond to that? Like part of the problem here is we keep playing me too. When you saw kind of the, the, you know, the red for red stuff happening and even governors I really like, like Doug Ducey in Arizona, who I think was a tremendous education governor. He let himself get browbeat where he was get basically preemptively gave him 20% raise. Nothing changed. There was no change in the structure of compensation, no change in teacher benefits, no change in how we were thinking about the work. It was just money that we were putting out the door, a huge chunk of it consumed by benefits, which don't actually help you attract or keep good young teachers. So part of a, a part of it tackling this has got to be, again, not just being what we're against, that we're against more bureaucrats and we're against padding teacher coffers and we're against overpriced benefits. But what are we for? Well, we're for spending these dollars in a way that's going to be good for kids. And part of that is making sure those dollars are really good for teachers who are doing good and important work and feeling valued and feeling rewarded when they're making a difference in kids' lives. Yeah, well, for me, for my part, of, all that sounds good and supportive. Um, but for my part of the handshake deal, like if the if the teachers would like tear down the activist flags and the I'm your mom now signs, then, you know, I'll, I'll shake hands on, on uh, doing everything that we can to ensure that education dollars flow to, to teacher salaries and that they are freed up from bureaucratic demands that, that keep them from, um, from doing the, the real important stuff with education that we've been talking about all along. Okay. Two final questions, one for Rick on technology and then um, Mike to wrap it up on, of course, school choice. <laughs> That's what we love to talk about here. Um, Rick, I know you have strong feelings about education technology, and um, I read recently that Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, says that technology could save education. And we talked about your views of on on ed tech last year on Student Server Systems when you uh, wrote another book. You're quite prolific, um, and you recently shared uh, your your thoughts on AI in an Education Next play, uh, piece where you said, "Forget cheating." When used as intended, AI will stymie learning, knowledge, and inquiry. So, Rick, what are your thoughts on ed technology, and how does that fit into uh, our vision for education? Sure. Um, and just to clarify, so on the AI piece, um, it can. I mean, it can. I mean, what's happening is kids spend less and less time talking to real human beings or reading real books, and more and more of what they know and learn flows through their phones or their iPads. And the more dependent they become on that for AI, the more what those AI algorithms are filtering into them is going to be what kids know and can do. And that actually, as we saw with this craziness with Google's Gemini, starts to raise real concerns um, for kids who are going to be wholly dependent on this artificial intelligence to tell them what's true, what's not true, and what matters. Mm -hmm. More generally, um, that points to, I think, the real issue, which is technology isn't either necessarily good or bad. Every time anybody invents anything in education, from the pencil to the chalkboard to the radio, uh, there's a whole bunch of folks in education who, uh, you, you know, get so excited, they run around losing their shorts. Uh, they get a lot of money from, you know, whoever has a lot of money at that moment, rich donors, to write excited white papers and dream up big innovations. And then every single time from the pencil to the chalkboard to the radio to the TV to the laptop. 10, 20 years later, we decided, well, we oversold that one, but this next one's going to be tremendous. It will save education. It'll save. It'll make a whole difference. Um, and I think we're going, we're living that right now with AI. Uh, the, the big the big issue, the concern for me, um, is what we have now, I think, increasingly come to realize about smartphones and kind of kids spending, you know, tweens spending five to six hours a day on social media and texting and gaming um, is that, that the whether or not this stuff in a given school can be used in educationally helpful ways isn't really the big issue here. The big issue is the way that this has transformed childhood and adolescence, the way it's yanking kids out of their lived lives, the way it's affecting their ability to relate to friends, the way it's affecting rhythms in the household and how kids sit at a dinner table with people. And so the, the educational promise of these things, the same as it always was, could be good, could not be good, depends how you use it. But what we've been through is technology, which is, I th think, had some really 
bad effects on the real lives of kids. Um, it doesn't have to, but, uh, but we, but, but parents haven't had good guidance on how to use it. Uh, people haven't been, um, you know, haven't done a good job of helping parents navigate this. Uh, too many parents um, have done the easy thing, partly because there's a collective action problem. If all your kids, uh, 10 or 11 year old friends, have a watch, then there's a lot of pressure on parents to like not Just hold on. No, just say no. I'm with you. We're that's what we're doing, but 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 it, but you you've talked to as many parents as I have no. who've related kind of the pressure they feel. They don't want their kid to be left out or not be part of the plan when the kids are all going for you know uh, burritos or Starbucks or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So 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 that's the problem. And what, what again, like I, where I started with AI, I do worry that right now the fact that Gemini came out we were all able to humiliate Google and laugh at it. The fact that it was so insanely woke and politically correct because we all have books on our shelves and we all can actually go and look at, you know, Norman Rockwell paintings and see what they actually look like on the wall. I am worried 20, 30 years from now when people have fewer and fewer books on the shelves, when they have absorbed less and less of this in non in ways that are not online, whether they would even be as aware of the crazy stuff that's going to be funneled uh, through the ranks of AI. And that's, I think, for me, uh, the larger set of questions rather than specifically, you know, is this time it going to be as helpful for education as we all hope? Mm-hmm. Um, I have to admit that I uh, went online to eBay and bought an old site of set, set of encyclopedias because I want this, <laughs> that like proof of reality, like like in paper on my shelves. And um, my 10th grader. There uh, we go. Okay, guys, public service announcement. Flip phones still exist. <laughs> Just say no, parents. Uh, <laughs> final question for, for my guards, our standard final question at Students Over Systems. Um, we haven't been talking about education freedom and school choice, Smith, but Mike, you are one of the leading experts on this topic in the country. And I'd love to know what is your favorite school choice myth that you would like to dispel today? Yeah, I think my favorite myth is that school choice policies and school choice are one in the same. That like for a state, if a state has school choice, it's if it has a voucher program or a charter school program and others. Obviously, this is a myth. Lots of school choice exists outside of if you use a voucher or an ESA or go to a charter school. I see lots of media coverage that sort of in, let's say, a state uh, is is debating an ESA program or others. It's this like, will school choice come to Minnesota? It's like, there's already a lot of school choice in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. The question is, who is going to have school choice in Minnesota? Um, and I think the more people, again, when we talk about that kind of average parent or, or average person, if they're only consuming it in the story that shows up in the newspaper or online, and they don't sort of think critically about that, they, they can start to really believe that myth. And it's just like, oh, wow, like this new school choice thing. And it's like, well, no, but wait a second. Didn't you buy your house to be close to that school? Yeah, that's school choice. Like, oh, wait, don't you send your kids to private school? Yeah, that's school choice too. Mm-hmm. So it's there's a lot of school choice happening. What school choice policy is really about is who is going to be able to choose their child's school not whether or not people in a given area will be able to choose their children's school. Oh, well, thanks for that, Mike. That's a, a new one. We haven't had that uh, right on. tackled before. So. Well, what's, the, what's the most common one that folks debunk? Uh, generally that that uh, private school choice will defund public schools and yes. that that's one of its goals. So um, that definitely is a pervasive one out there and True. we will continue need to, needing to make sure we're, we're tackling that. Um, so Rick and Mike, thank you so much for uh, proposing ways to get education right and laying out this conservative vision. And and thanks for talking with us on Student Server Systems today. And thanks for having us. Good to be with you. Encouraging. If you enjoyed this episode of Student Server Systems, please consider leaving a review on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends. To learn more about the work of the Education Freedom Center, please go to IWF dot org slash EFC. Thank you for listening to Students Over Systems. Until next time, keep celebrating education freedom and brighter futures.